So in a way, this is a very simple example of feature importance because it tells us how important each pixel is when driving the behavior of the layer one neuron. Now, in general, nonlinear systems, this is highly non-trivial, but it's a major way for us to understand a system. In fact, I should mention here, it's very popular in neuroscience where people ask, given a neuron that I might record from in the actual brain, what does it mean about the outside world? Its high feature importance is highly relevant from an ethics perspective. I have a machine learning system. I want to be able to tell you which aspects of the inputs does our machine learning system really focus on. It's highly relevant for explainable AI, where ideas like Shapley values are used to explain how a machine learning system works to humans by basically telling them these are the relevant variables. So, in the network that we just built, we used ReLU. Why did we use ReLU? Well, a lot of people somehow believe in the superior of, of ReLU, and there's a historical reason for that. So when AlexNet came up, it propelled deep learning into the limelight by showing that big vision problems can be solved really well by deep learning systems. And AlexNet used ReLU and consequently a lot of subsequent people focused on it. Well, but is it justified? Let's, uh, let us look at a range of transfer functions. Here's a nice list that Mishkin et al. did of different functions. So let's look at a few of them. Now, let's see what it would mean for ReLU's or for transfer functions to really matter. It means that for them to be important, I expect that they have a relatively big influence relative to the amount of data that we have. So what we have here on the left-hand side is just an analysis of how important the amount of data is. And we see that as we scale the data set from say 600,000 to 1.2 uh, million, the, uh, by removing images that uh, we lose our performance and we go from getting roughly 45% maybe right to like roughly getting 40% 40, uh, 40 right. So it's a small difference that that number, uh, that, that factor two of training data makes, but it's a highly significant one. But it gives us a scale to compare the importance of transfer functions to. What we have see on the right hand side is the effect of using different transfer functions. If we have a linear system, of course, we lose a lot of performance, maybe twice as much as we gain by that scaling from 600 to 1.2 million. If we use Tench, which is no longer very popular, we lose about 2%. And if we use uh, relative to ReLU, whereas if we use some of the more modern transfer functions, we gain 2-3%. Now you can say, well, 2-3%, that's not all that much but it actually is a very large uh, effect relative to the amount of data. We could have gotten the same performance with half of the data and keep in mind that this kind of data is really expensive. So let's talk through them. Here we have tench. It's called hyperbolic tangent, which is the function. It's often pronounced as tench. It's e to the 2z minus one divided by e to the 2z plus one. But the really important thing is it's just a smooth differentiable function that goes from minus one to one. It smooths out any discontinuity. It used to be very popular because people believed that it approximates the property of real neurons, that they saturate, that at high firing rate, their firing rate can't get any higher. However, the evidence that real neurons actually ever saturate is extremely limited. It's largely been replaced by ReLU, and intuitions might relate to probability. Now, the tangent output only spans the range from minus one to one. Probabilities go from zero to one, so it's a simple scaling between them. And then there's like some smooth transition where evidence makes us believe in one hypothesis versus another. So if what's going on in brain uh, in a deep learning system uh, is that the system internally basically operates based on probabilities, this seems like a decent choice. It works well on some meta-learning problems in parts because it's nicely multiple times differentiable. Here we have ReLU. The big advantage is it's very fast to compute. It's the most commonly used function. The resulting functions are piecewise linear, as we saw. It's not actually differentiable everywhere, namely not at zero, but this is often okay. Uh, it's more of a problem when 
the derivative is zero, where we have the dead ReLU prom, but it's pretty unlikely for a ReLU to be dead for all output. Now, like if we initialized a ReLU so that for none of the training samples it would ever be active, it would always have zero gradient, and therefore it would never learn anything. But it's pretty unlikely. Now, an alternative, a very simple alternative to that is leaky ReLU. Well, we basically replace it with a small but still positively increasing function in the zero area. It fixes the problem of dead ReLUs. It, uh, in a way, uh, helps us deal with vanishing exploding gradient problems. It's not used very much in practice compared to ReLU, but it often makes problems go away. There are, of course, cases where we need functions to be twice differentiable. For example, in meta-learning where we learn to learn, and therefore we have to calculate the derivative of gradients after the parameters of the learning process. Or maybe we simply want to use an optimization method that uses a Hessian. You will hear some about this in the future. Here we have the logistic sigmoid, another popular uh, cost, uh, loss, um, activation function. That in this case it goes from 0 to 1. It's similar to tanj, but asymptotes at 0 and 1 instead of minus 1 and 1. It's only used in special cases nowadays. Now, let us compare transfer functions on animal faces. Now, like, the best way to know if this idea is meaningful is ask, well, does the transfer function really matter? So which one work well, and do you have any intuition of why? <laughs>